Are you ready to perform at your highest potential? Thank you for joining this GP Strategies webinar, where we'll explore best practices and innovative insights to help you and your organization improve performance. Hey, and welcome everyone to today's session. Um, we're so happy that you've taken the time to join us uh, and we have a great session planned today. My name is Kim Heyer, I'm with GP Strategies and I'm the host for today's session. So before we get started with our presenters, I just want to let everyone know that we will be sending out a link to the recording and a copy of the presentation deck within 24 hours after the session today. And of course, everyone's lines have been muted, but we also want to make sure that this time together is as interactive as possible. So I want to encourage you to um, add your comments during the presentation, use the chat to engage with questions or um, communications with the other attendees and pre uh, presenters that we have. But if you do have any specific questions for the presenters, we ask that you use the Q&A option so that we can keep track of them and make sure that we answer them during the session or time permitted, we'll get to them at the end of today's presentation presentation, sorry. And again, I wanna welcome everybody for joining and I wanna to introduce today's presenters. Um, Scott, Scott Barber has over 22 years of experience in training and performance and has an instructor, lecturer, instructional designer and project manager for a wide range of training and performance solutions in multiple industry segments. Scott is a dual certified scrum master. I got that right. Agile Alliance, Scaled Agile, and held certifications as a Microsoft Certified Systems Engineer and as a SAP Certified Consultant. He has an undergraduate degree in Business Management Information Systems and a Master of Business Administration graduate degree. Scott is currently engaged in research as a doctoral candidate in Strategic Leadership at Liberty University. Welcome, Scott. And I also want to introduce Brittany Jordan. She has over 10 years of experience in applied behavior analyst, leadership, and business solution planning. She holds a Bachelor of Business Administration and Management, a Master of Science in Marketing Research Analytics, and most recently has become a certified Scrum Master through Scaled Agile. Brittany is currently working towards her certification in user experience design. So we have a great session today. And with that, I'm going to let Scott and Brittany take it from there. Have a great session, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, that was us. I should have clicked. Here we go. Sorry, Brittany. Yeah, no problem. Um, but yeah, before we begin, I um, wanted to reiterate, um, please feel free to utilize the chat as frequently as possible. Um, I'll be monitoring the chat so we can answer any questions we may have. Um, so the agenda for today, we're going to talk about some of the adoption challenges, um, some of the critical adoption factors, what the Lean Learning Experience or LLX is, how you can implement LLX, and then um, we'll have a Q&A session at the end. Um, so here's the participation part we were talking about. Um, we're about to talk about some of the challenges. <clears throat> so what challenges have you seen in your digital transformation efforts or, you know, any kind of adoption? Um, please feel free to put those in the chat. And like I said, I'll be monitoring. Um, yes, the chat is open. <clears throat> I'll be monitoring the chat. So thinking of any challenges that you can think of with adoption. And we'll wait for a second to see if anything comes through. Okay, we have one from Amanda Wilson, staff turnover during the adoption process. Absolutely. Technology not working as well at home. Yes, yes, yes. That's capacity. That's a wonderful one. Yes, from Connie. Complex security requirements. Everyone's too busy to learn. The culture. Absolutely. These are wonderful. Time. And then communication to prepare for go live. Thank you all so much. These are great. Um, Scott, If uh, just from your research and your experience, what are some of the common challenges and adoption that you've seen? And then we'll talk about how Agile can rectify some of those. 
Yeah, thank you. It's interesting. I actually looked into this particular question over a year ago to come up with a research proposal uh, because when you look at some of the stats, right, some of the overall stats with ERP implementations specifically, uh, digital transformations generally, including customized off the shelf software, things of that nature, uh, you see fairly consistently that there's some issues. Uh, and you really know that for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, you can see, I mean, uh, ERP itself is a huge industry. Uh, and uh, things, things go wrong with ERP implementations quite commonly. And we'll look at how commonly here in a second. Uh, and so there is a lot of research and study devoted to figuring out what exactly is going wrong with those. And I took a look at uh, quite a few studies to come up with these, these stats and to start to come up with some conclusions also. There are really two different phases that you have to concern yourself with. And I think some of our folks were talking about uh, some of the challenges in both the implementation phase and the second phase. So first, the challenge is getting to go live itself. Uh, and if we look at this, right, typically ERP is a project. So you would want to look at this as you look at typical project management. Uh, is my project running on time, on scope, and on budget? And when we start to look at the stats uh, about ERP implementation success, we find about 43% of them uh, are actually on time. In other words, they met their original timeline. About 8.6% of them uh, are on budget, so the vast majority of them exceed their budget, and only about 33% of them implement their originally anticipated scope. And when you add all of these numbers together, you see about 12% of all ERP implementations actually meet their original plan. It was on time, on budget, and on scope. Uh, so something's going on here, right? There's some systemic issues that perhaps we can't figure out. Uh, so the, the study that I did was to take a look at the critical success factors uh, for ERP implementation across a broad range of uh, peer-reviewed studies uh, that involved uh, hundreds of interviews with thousands of people. So really a huge amount of information uh, to try to see if we could, if anybody had a consistent view of, of exactly what's going on here. Uh, and I could not find one. I mean, critical success factors, you usually hear, you know, well, if we do a good job of communications, or top management involvement or uh, training or organizational change management. As long as we do these four or five things well, everything is gonna be okay. Uh, but what the literature revealed in this big massive uh, study that I did uh, was that there really is no consistent uh, magic formula uh, for being effective at an ERP implementation. Uh, so clearly something else is going on here. Uh, I turned to uh, complexity theory uh, and what's called the Kenwood framework. And Kenwood, if you've never heard of it, it's a Welsh term, basically means domain. And uh, ERP implementations, really business problems, can fall into one of four different domains uh, where the solution is either obvious and simple, uh, the solution is complicated, uh, the solution involves complexity, or perhaps the solution is chaotic. And if you look at examples of these, uh, a problem that has an obvious and simple solution might be your shoes being untied. So for your shoes being untied, you probably have a best practice for that of how you retie your shoes. Simple problem requires a simple solution. That's a great example of that. Uh, a more complex problem, and the analogy that I like to use here is open heart surgery or a heart transplant. Uh, it's very complicated to do a heart transplant. Uh, it is fraught with peril. Uh, you can, right, if you're a medical doctor, get the training and experience that you need in order to be successful at that. So the steps to achieve a successful heart transplant are complicated, but we're reasonably assured we know what those steps are and we know how to solve the issue. We know how to troubleshoot, et cetera. And training experience can help us to overcome that. Uh, there is another domain though that is a particular concern and that is the complexity domain. Uh, complexity domain, we're talking about complexity theory here and I won't go too deep into it, but essentially means that you can try something and the results are gonna vary. So perhaps a solution that worked in the past, a best practice, uh, you try because it's worked in the past, but this time it doesn't work. Uh, in a complexity situation, there are just a huge number of variables and uh, a large change can result in a, a very minor result. But on the other hand, a small change can result in a very uh, large change. Uh, so a different kind of solution is required to effectively deal with these complexity situations which based on my research, a lot, if not the vast majority of these implementations fall into. Uh, the last domain, of course, is chaos. Uh, you know, a volcano erupting, pretty much you, the only thing you can do there is run. 
Uh, so we, 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 we have a tendency to think of our ERP learning solutions in the, in the terms of these complexity environments. So there's a lot of variation. Uh, there are a lot of changes. Uh, perhaps traditional, particularly governance structures don't work very well in trying to get us to the finish line. Uh, so we, we, we fully recognize that a lot of these ERP limitations, particularly the big, big ones, are going to involve a lot of complexity. So a different solution is required. So you have the implementation phase that concerns you, right? You've got to get to the go live. Well, what about the go live itself? Here, our business problem is a little bit different. Uh, here, what we're really concerning ourselves with is business performance, right? We spent a lot of time, effort, resources to get this ERP system implemented. We want to make sure that we're getting a return on investment at that. So we have to concern ourselves then after go live about business performance. Typically, uh, in the adoption phase, business performance is going to go down. And that's a fairly natural thing. If I were to switch from my iPhone to an Android phone, uh, even though those phones have the same basic functionality, uh, things are going to be different. Email is going to be different. Surfing the internet is going to be different. Customizing is going to be different. All these little things are going to be different. So as soon as I make that switch, uh, my productivity is going to go down. Same thing happens in an ERP implementation. Just a natural result. People are going to have to do things differently. Uh, so productivity for the organization is going to go down. And a lot of organizations can eventually return back up to their uh, original productivity level. Some cases they don't. Uh, but if you look at the stats, about 67% of all ERP implementations don't receive a return on investment. In other words, uh, we spend a whole lot of time and effort and we're not getting the results that we expect. Uh, some ERP implementations do achieve ROI and it's a long and winding path to get there. Uh, and that's only about 33% of them. Okay, so I'm gonna pause here for questions, observations. Brittany, you can tell me in the chat if we have anything that, that we should address. Absolutely. See, nothing coming through just yet. Well, so we find it's very useful, right? In this, in this big area of complexity to come up with a mental model that helps us to think through uh, effective ERP solutions. And I like to use an analogy and the analogy I like to use is skydiving. So our job is that we have our users, right? And they've jumped out of an airplane. So they're in flight right now, quite literally. Uh, and they're gonna go live. Guess what symbolizes the go live? That green stuff right down below. So it's our job to get these folks safely to the ground. And it's gonna take a lot of work in order to do that. So really we wanna think of three critical components that we have to overcome, three challenges, uh, uh, to overcome the challenges, sorry, we wanna focus on three critical adoption factors. And those three critical adoption factors are the technology, and we've heard about this, right? Technology is not working well, so we have to have high quality technology. Uh, we have to have ability, so our users here have to have the ability, the knowledge and skills they need to be successful. And there has to be commitment also. Now, if we look at our skydivers, right, they have to have all three of these things in order to be successful. So they have to have technology. Some of the technology you can't see. The airplane, right, that brought them and dropped them. Uh, there's other technology we can see here, right? They're wearing helmets. Uh, they have GoPro cameras. What are those little backpacks, Brittany? What are those things called? Those they're all wearing parachutes. Yeah, those are pretty important to the process too. So very critical technology. Uh, and Right, so we have to have all of this going for them. Uh, in addition to that, though, our jumpers have to have ability. You have to learn how to get out of the door. You have to learn how to land safely. Uh, hey, what happens if your parachute doesn't work? Uh, you know, the old joke from parachutes tell is uh, no problem. Just uh, when you get to the ground, just exchange it for one that works. Uh, no, our troubleshooting, right? We have to know our troubleshooting steps. How do we do the reserve shoot? So the people have to have the knowledge and skills that they're going to need to be successful. Right? We, want them to, we want to get them safely to the ground. Uh, but the last and also equally important is commitment. Uh, you're not getting Scott to jump out of an airplane ever. Uh, I'm terrified of heights, uh, not gonna happen. So if you're gonna try to convince me to do it, you have to have me motivated and you have to have me committed to this. So we'd like to look at technology, ability and commitment, which typically corresponds to the three major teams involved in an ERP implementation. Technology typically belongs to IT and the project team. Ability belongs to the learning team. And commitment typically belongs to organizational change management. Now, we all work together, of course. Uh, but the reason this mental model is important, because if you fail in any one of these three areas, 
probably your ERP implementation will fail. And there's another challenge that we have too. And that leads to a question. So all of these people get safely to the ground and then what happens, right? Is that it? Do we celebrate? Are we done? Well, the parachute is yes, but in the business world, no. Because when all of these people get to the ground, right, and they're going to be confused and disoriented and things are going to look new and different, they're actually going to have to do their jobs now. So, and that's where we start to concern ourselves with uh, learning is how are we going to have the behaviors that we want after a go live that are, going to res that are going to result in us being able to drive our return on investment. Now, a typical learning solution uh, looks something like this in the ERP implementation. You would uh, use the Adam methodology, right? You have different phases where you first analyze and then you design and then you develop and then you instruct and then you evaluate. Uh, what typically happens here, uh, and I've heard uh, at least one or two project managers say, training is something that happens at the very end, right? So this, this is a very, very common attitude. Uh, and you also see this attitude a lot in research. Training is just something that happens at the very end. And what inevitably happens is a lot of information is compiled together at the last minute. Uh, it is dumped on the end users, right? Massive amounts of training, massive amounts of learning happening all at the last minute. And the inevitable result to that is end users who are confused, who don't know what they do to do when they get to the ground, who have no idea how to operate in this new environment. Learner motivation goes down, right? Remember, you have to have the commitment involved. So a poor learning solution drives down the commitment that we need. And this is one of the major contributing factors, according to research and our experience, into why ERP training doesn't work all that well sometimes. We're just putting too much information on them at once. Uh, they have no idea what the important information is. We're talking about the end users. They end up being confused. And the inevitable result is, instead of using the system as we designed it, as we envisioned it, uh, our users will come up with workarounds, right? They won't use the new system. They'll just try to find the, the easiest way to try to do something because they don't understand it. And we don't get the return on investment that we want off of the system because it's not being used as intended. And I'll pause here for questions too. Anything so far, Brittany? Nothing so far. Okay, excellent. So uh, what is the solution for this? And Brittany is gonna talk about two aspects that we look at in LLX, the lean learning experience. And uh, I will turn it over to you now, Brittany. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the team aspect of the lean learning experience. I am currently a member of an agile team as a developer. Um, so to me, the team is you know, one of the most critical parts of the agile process. Um, the way the team is structured, there are no hierarchies or roles on an agile team. So you never have, you know, any team members sitting around and waiting for another developer to finish their job so that they can do theirs. And this eliminates bottlenecks and it greatly improves efficiency because you have all members of the agile team working at all times on every stage of the project from you know, research and analysis all the way up through delivery and post-delivery. So in this sense, a lean team means we're removing certain barriers that you know, would increase the costs or drag down our efficiency. Um, and so these teams, we are adaptive and resilient. The team not only expects change, but you learn to embrace it um, as a means of continuously improving what we're doing in our product. Um, there's, there's really not any amount of planning that will tell you exactly what a project is going to look like from start to finish. Um, agile teams expecting and adapting to the unexpected is what makes them so effective. And then, of course, you have changes. So with these changes comes a need for, you know, quick and creative solutions. Um, we, we do this through, you know, an agile team, we demonstrate accountability and transparency to each other, to the product owners. We meet daily, um, discuss the work that's been done, what work will be done before the next time we meet. And then we openly identify issues and bring them to the team daily to find creative solutions and sacrifice as little time as possible in doing so. Um, and then there's also a heavy focus on how we can improve our process. It's, 
the agile approach is kind of a never satisfied approach. Um, we say, okay, that was good. So how, how are we gonna be better next time? And um, that's a lot of where, you know, the agile technique come in, comes in. So Scott, if you would tell us a little bit more about the, the agile technique and the structure that does help to make our team so efficient. Yeah, absolutely. Now, before, before, just to emphasize what you said, what is one of my favorite sayings? Today is the blank of the project. The it's dumbest day of the project. Today is the dumbest day of the project, right? We're going to know more tomorrow than we know today, so let's act accordingly. Uh, so this whole flexibility, adaptability, resiliency of critical importance to really be agile. I also want to be clear about something else. When we talk about agile, and there's a lot of touchy-feely aspects to agile, absolutely. But the reason we do all of this is not because we're touchy-feely people, which we are, but is we don't do it because of that. Uh, but we do it because we know that we're going to be more effective and more efficient pound for pound than any other team, particularly those running an ADI methodology uh, or using conventional approaches. We know we're going to get superior results, so that's why we do it. We also know there's going to be a lot of pressure, uh, so we all have to be friends. Uh, that's very, very important. Okay. Uh, the technique is important also. So it's not only the team aspect, and the team aspect is of critical importance, uh, but technique also. Uh, now, the two models that I was referring to earlier, right, the, the dump truck model, the common model, uh, in research, that's called the discovery model. And what does the discovery model mean? Well, that means I'm going to give you, end user, a whole bunch of information, right, a whole bunch of facts, and you have to discover for yourself which of the important ones are. So I'm going to tell you a bunch of theory, and then at Go Live, you figure out how to apply that theory. Uh, what we know about that from research is like 90, 95% of the people can't learn that way. So it's really pretty ridiculous to use that as an approach. Uh, so instead, we use an alternative approach, uh, philosophy called guided experiential learning, uh, where we focus on the critical content, right? What are people really going to have to do uh, at Go Live? We take a very heavy use look at instructional design, making sure we have motivated users, starting with the most important question for adult learners and answering that. And that question is why? Why am I doing this? Why do I have to learn this? Uh, making sure the experience is experiential. And most of all, making sure that we're giving them just what they need to be successful at GoLive and the techniques that they need to learn additionally uh, as they gain more and more experience with the system. So we view learning as a process, uh, not an event. And this really goes into the outcome. So in LLX, right? So we have the adapt, analyze, produce, evaluate. So we go through this process that Brittany referred to the whole time. So we are not uh, go, one phase is over and then the next phase begins. We're gonna go through all of our phases continuously. So we try to come up with a better product. That also gives us the ability to come up with earlier learning solutions. And pre-learning is typically a critical component with ERP. Uh, so we want to have stuff that is ready earlier. We want to look at different audiences. Uh, in uh, our current client, uh, we needed a rapid learning solution for our SIT1 testers. The project team came to us because we were involved earlier in the process. We had already started thinking about some of these things. We were actually able to deliver a rapid learning solution to them in less than a week, I believe. Uh, you know, it wasn't our primary focus, but at the same time, if we could take advantages of uh, what are called economies of scope uh, to help other audiences, we want to do that because we're an agile team. We know they're running through difficult times, right? They're in the middle of their implementation. So we want to help them out also. And in return, they help us out. See, relationships are important. And what we want to do is we want to grow knowledge. And as we have the flowers here, not the dump truck, uh, in a longer period of time, People only have a limited bandwidth to learn, so we don't want to overwhelm them with a bunch of learning at once. Uh, we want learning to be a process. And the result that we have seen is happier end users. They have greater learner motivation. Remember, motivation, commitment is very, very important in the ERP learning solution. And what we find is when we use the results of the lean learning experience, so we're no longer talking about training, right? Training events. Training is just an interim solution, right? It's a means to get us to an end. Uh, so the number of training classes that we deliver don't really matter so much. Have people learned what we expected them to learn? And are they on a learning journey where they can increase their learning over time? Because it's going to take time to do this. So forget about training. This is about learning. Scott, speaking yeah, of sorry. time. Sorry? Um, speaking of time, we did have a question in the chat before yeah. we go forward. Um, Chris would like to know what happens when or if timelines become unexpectedly accelerated here. 
Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And we have seen that before. I mean, we talked about our weak solution. Uh, so we talked about project management. Uh, uh, in Agile, we deal with project management a little bit differently. So in traditional project management, you're going to vary uh, scope, time, and resources. Uh, we say in Agile, our resources are fixed, our timeline is fixed, our scope would vary. So we would look at what is the most important thing for us to produce that's going to give us the biggest business results, and that's where our focus is. Yeah. Scope management, scope creep, also a concern for Agile teams. The way we manage it, though, is a little bit different and a lot more effective, by the way. Right. Lean learning delivery. We're trying to stay lean. Mm -hmm. Got one more one more question. I know yes, I'm, I know I'm throwing a kink in it here. No, you're good. Um, Akilu would like to know. So love the aspect of learning as a process and not an event. So how might we design a learning journey um, kind of depicted here? Uh, yeah, well, I can tell you what we're doing on our current client. We actually envision uh, several different learning interventions. Uh, one of those is pre-learning, some of the earlier content that we can produce. I mean, we're, we're talking about an organization who has not used ERP before. Uh, they've used some homegrown systems. So there's a lot of terminology that's different. Uh, there's some of the business functionality, business processes that are going to be different. And we already know a lot about these things. So we're creating learning objects right now for pre-learning to get people introduced into the terminology earlier. Uh, and in addition to that, we're looking at a pretty sophisticated phased approach uh, based on uh, some of the micro learning for pre learning, uh, some in e learning and enhanced e learning, in, even for some audiences. And then some additional audiences have hands on skill lab, uh, hands on labs where they'll come in and practice with the training server in a facilitated environment. And then the last element that we're adding on, which is uh, fairly atypical in my experience, probably in yours too, uh, is we're doing what are called skill labs. So we're going to train people. Uh, on the critical things, and then we're going to evaluate that they, if they can do it uh, right before go live. The analogy that I like to use is uh, you're testing the heck out of the system before you go live. Why aren't you testing the people before you go live? I mean, don't you want to know if both of those are working well? Um, and that's uh, so, you know, we have uh, we have a multi phased approach, and the phased approach is different depending on the exact role because the learning needs are different. So, in our analysis, not only did we look at the functionality, but we took a detailed look at our audiences and built personas. Uh, that's a part of the agile uh, process also, right? Understanding, developing empathy for the end users. That's something that we did also. Okay. No, thank you for the questions. The questions are great. Thank you very much. All right. So lean learning experience. So learning journey, not training. Increased business performance. You know, ladies and gentlemen, this is why you're doing ERP, right? You want to increase your business performance, right? Why go through the time and effort of implementing the ERP system going through a digital transformation if it's not going to result in business benefits. So we, we, we look at those, we talk about those, we talk about KPIs, we talk about driving KPIs. So this is a critical, critical topic for the training team. Uh, so we talk about this a lot. And then the acceleration to return. I mean, that is absolutely what this is all about. I mean, as a training team, as a learning team, we, our job is not to train people. Our job is to, to contribute to the positive performance of the business. That's how we think about it. That's how we orient our learning solutions. So that's what we do. Uh, and I have, a, I have a case study to share with you uh, about one of the first times that we used the LLX approach. This was a global uh, supply chain company. They had about 120 or so warehouses throughout the world. They were going through a phased ERP implementation, one warehouse at a time, so they could learn from it and do better. Uh, what they found, though, that, uh, that their implementation was failing because the first warehouse could never return back to their original productivity level. I mean, they weren't even doing as good as they were before the implementation uh, for two years, which is quite a long time not to produce very well. Uh, they tried a second one, they did a little bit better, but it was taking weeks uh, for them to return to those previous levels, still not achieving an ROI. Uh, traditional project management was not working, traditional learning was not working. Uh, so this was a real problem for them. And this is where they asked GP to come in and do an analysis and we did. Uh, so we quickly designed, we did an analysis, and we figured out, okay, this is the crux of where things are going wrong. Now, it's not a big, huge surprise, right? The warehouse, and what's the most important, it's not the warehouse manager, sorry, uh, who are the most important workers there? It's the warehouse workers, right? The people who are actually physically moving the goods around. And this was the crux of their business problem. They did a very, very poor job because they used classroom training for their warehouse workers. So the warehouse workers didn't know Right, what they should actually do to receive a shipment, to put things away, or to, uh, to send out a customer shipment. They didn't understand the steps of the process and exactly what they should do. 
So we designed a rapid learning solution that was not classroom based, it was experientially based using guided experiential learning. Uh, and the results we saw of this were really very dramatic. So uh, after they applied this new learning solution for their warehouse workers, uh, the next warehouse returned back to their original productivity level within 31 days, so much quicker than they'd ever done it before. And then when we learned and did it a little bit better the next time, we got that down to 12 days. So very short gap, right? Very effective, efficient learning solution, but also a learning solution that drove the productivity of the business. And this is where our focus has to absolutely be. Any questions from this? This was a great result uh, from LLS. All right, so if you wanna get started on your learning journey for LLX, what do you need to do? Really three different steps I think are of critical importance. Uh, the first of these is to examine your assumptions. Uh, just because you think you are doing it right doesn't mean you're doing it right. Um, the first step actually of the, the scientific uh, method is an admission of fallibility, is an admission that you could be wrong. Uh, so you wanna examine your assumptions. How have we approached this in the past? Are there any alternatives that we could possibly use to do this better? So uh, frame decoupling is what this is called, examining your assumptions. We do this all the time as an agile team. You gotta learn how to do this. And the only way to learn how to do it, and we'll see that in a second. Uh, second is develop an agile mindset, right? You don't develop an agile mindset by just saying, hey, I'm agile today. Uh, it's a lot more to it than that. The learning journey here also. Uh, the entry point for all of us, the entry point for me, for Brittany, for really anybody new to the team, is a free online training called uh, Scrum Training Series. And uh, if you could put that up in the, the chat, www.scrumtrainingseries.com. Uh, and this is uh, you know some short, simple videos. Uh, they're really about using Scrum in software development, which is where Scrum started. Uh, but we found that a lot of the principles and challenges they, they have in software development apply equally to learning. And so that's why we originally decided to try this in the learning space and, and started to see some success uh, like they have in the, uh, the software development world. So this is a great place to start to develop that agile mindset, to start to change your thinking, go through that Scrum training series, uh, read a book on agile, uh, take a class, right? Become a certified Scrum master, or certified developer, uh, you know, learn it from other people who are going through the agile transformations themselves. So a lot of great information about there. Uh, it takes time to develop this agile mindset. And the last and most important step is to learn by doing, right? Get your hands dirty. Uh, you're going to have to go in and actually try some things. You're going to have to fail, right? We embrace failure in agile. We're glad when we fail because we want to learn something from it and do better the next time. We don't cover up failure. We learn from it. And the only way you fail is by taking risks, by being innovative, by learning and doing. So we have highly advocate that too. Okay, so examine your assumptions, develop an agile mindset and learn by doing. What do you all think? What are your questions? No questions coming in okay. just yet. Um, we've had a lot of great feedback, like the approach, like the journey. Here we go. Chris is asking, are there any industries that this mindset may not apply to? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that sounds like a, that sounds like a universal, but uh, I mean, if you start to think about it, and, and I have, as part of my research into leadership, well, there are two kind of traditional leadership mindsets. One is transactional, the other is transformational. Uh, transformational leadership right, has a tendency, which is a positive leadership methodology. Uh, I won't go over the details, but it, has a, it, it is more successful in more business circumstances, including, by the way, international business circumstances. There was a huge study done by a global research organization where they talked to tens of thousands of people internationally uh, based on contingent, contingent leadership theory to see what, you know, learning preference, uh, what leadership preference is preferred by followers. And by far, transformational leadership gets the best results internationally. Uh, it also has a tendency to get the best results regardless of the organization. Uh, you may see, right, an organization that has a bunch of, uh, a bunch of, and, and transactional leadership was designed for, uh, you know, manufacturing with a lot of hourly workers, and to manage your hourly workers, transactional leadership is good. Uh, but other than that, transformational leadership 
And Agile is, is absolutely a positive uh, transformational leadership style, uh, works a lot better than, than traditional methodologies. So the research is pretty clear on that. And then from Pat, how do you sell this mindset to leaders? Um, and then earlier when we were talking about the challenges, C-level leaders also came up at that point too. Yeah, that is, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? Because uh, it, it depends on the leader, right? Do you have a leader who is inspirational and is used to inspiring people? Uh, or do you have a leader who wants to get down and micromanage? You know, the micromanaging leaders, there's, there's not much you can do anything about, uh, about except to encourage them that leadership is not really about uh, the, the management administrative aspects. Leadership is more about inspiring people, right? Setting a vision, uh, helping people to understand that vision. And again, I'm talking about transformational leadership, right? Uh, in, being inspirational is key to that. Uh, uh, intellectually stimulating people is very important to that also. Um, providing an idealized influence, right? Being a good role model for people and individualized consideration, right? Treating everybody as if they're, it, well, everybody is important. So treating them like they're important. Uh, so uh, those are the critical things that, that agile leaders need to develop, not really some of the tactical stuff that we talk about in uh, Scrum. You know, leaders who are becoming agile leaders, they need to, uh, you know, get away from worrying about status reports and uh, things of that nature and look more at, you know, how am I promoting the agile mindset within my organization? Because that's your most critical function as far as a leadership function. Any other questions, Brittany? Uh, yes, just had one come in. Yeah. Um, Jesse in the chat was talking about struggling to gain adoption of Agile in their HR team. And then adding to that, Alex asked, what would be the best approach for adoption within an HR team? Yeah, uh, so the, you know, this is, it's difficult. It's difficult to become Agile. So as a Scrum Master, you, you really have two specific challenges that you have to deal with. Uh, one is your, your ego. Right, your ego is dangerous if you're a scrum master uh, because you you want to be the genius that knows everything, and instead you become a uh, you become a facilitator and you're trying to to shape the team. Uh, and the other, which sounds contradictory, it's not. Uh, scrum has very simple set of rules. Follow the rules laid out in Scrum. Right, they give you the structure that you will need in order to be free within that structure, to innovate, uh, to adapt. I mean, Agile strikes some people as chaotic and it can be chaotic. Uh, really the key to success though is being very regimented in how you apply the principles of Scrum. Same meetings, same format, uh, try not to let things deviate. Don't let your, um, don't let your uh, daily standup turn into a status meeting because status meetings are stupid. Uh, you know, there, there are all of these things that you have to look at to really you as a scrum master have to have this agile mindset. Uh, I hate to use this expression, but you, you definitely have to drink the Kool-Aid and become a believer. And then you can lead others to be believers also. Right, Brittany? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, Scott and Brittany, I appreciate you You're taking welcome. the time out today. If anybody has any more questions, um, if you just want to add them to the chat or the Q&A, we'll get to them. Um, but if not, um, we'll go ahead and start wrapping things up and give people a few minutes of their time back for today. Um, so um, I don't see any other questions coming through. Brittany, do you see anything? I don't. I don't. Well, first of all, I want to thank you, Scott and Brittany, for a great session. You guys are wonderful presenters, and um, I, we had a really great time. It was very informative. And at this time, I just want to say thank you to everybody who did attend today. I appreciate you taking your time and joining us on this GP Strategies webinar. And I hope and wish you all a happy and productive rest of your day. Thank you. This webinar is brought to you by GP Strategies. Together, we can create a world where business excellence makes possibilities achievable. You can access more webinars or download additional resources at gpstrategies.com forward slash resource hyphen library.